Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this ATIP Ocean webinar on the go, no go moment of the uh, Horizon Europe demonstration project. My name is Lotta Birtima. I'm a senior policy officer at ETIP Ocean, which is the European technology and innovation platform for ocean energy. So we uh, aim at accelerating the sector's development by sharing information amongst the, the sector um, and learning from each other and, and uh, sharing those experiences. So that's what we're doing here today as well. Um, just sharing my screen quickly. There you go. So today we are talking about this go no go decision that is included in um, in those new let's say demonstration projects in Horizon Europe, and uh, this is a specific moment in the project where you have to have um, a series of uh, let's say milestones or or um, steps to to have completed before you can then go to that uh, real sea or real life demonstration so today we um we will start the webinar with an introduction to the uh, the background let's say of this webinar and this webinar series in general so Pablo Ruiz Minguela from Technalia who are uh, part of the ETIP Ocean Management and will give us a short introduction on that then we will hear from Robert Goodchild who is the head of unit at CINEA he will explain uh, what that moment go no go moment is and and uh, and how to include it in your project. And then we have a case study from Core Power Ocean, a wave developer from Unisilva, technical project manager, because they are actually uh, at the moment uh, going through or just gone through their uh, go, no go moment. So, so that's a good experience to share. And then we will have a Q&A at the end um, of the webinar. So if you have any questions, don't hesitate to write them in the Q&A box and we will take them after the three presentations. And that was my very short introduction. I will now stop sharing and uh, give the floor to Pablo Ruiz Minguela. Uh, good morning, everyone. And thank you, Lota, for this introduction to the webinar. Um, I'm going to make a quick overview to the strategic research and innovation uh, agenda for ocean energy uh, that sets, as Lota uh, has announced previously, a context for uh, this webinar. Um, let me share my screen if I... Uh, no, this... Yeah, and I need to put in presenter mode. Yes. Okay. Um, okay. So I think I'm ready and you can see my screen. Um, the strategic research and innovation agenda for ocean energy is a, uh, I'll try to put this, I don't know if it is blocking the view uh, a reference document for the whole ocean energy sector but it's specifically for funding uh, public funding organizations this can be the european commission member states or regional agencies in order to inspire uh, research calls it is a document that was not produced from scratch it updates in reality key priority challenges that were um, in the previous strategic agenda. Um, and the main driver for this update was achieving ocean energy commercialization. The, this document uh, that we might be aware, you, you might be aware of, has been developed in close cooperation, in, in, in fact, with the sector stakeholder, and probably we we you that you are attending now the, the webinar, it was officially launched in 2020. Uh, I put um, the a link to, to download the document, uh, but it is accessible through the ETIP Ocean website. Um, this document, the SRA, has been developed in a context where the ocean, ocean energy plays a crucial role in meeting uh, green 
steel objectives and 100% decarbonized energy system. So there are several strategies within the Green Deal objectives that enter into uh, considerations such as the offshore renewable uh, strategy, industrial strategy, climate laws, uh, circular economy, uh, or SMEs strategies, among others. The uh, SRAA quantifies the research, development, uh, and, and innovation effort uh, needed to move forward uh, this sector. And basically, over five years, uh, it uh, proposes to mobilize uh, around 1 billion euro. And this uh, amount of uh, expenditure uh, that will occur between uh, 2021, 2025, roughly, uh, it is um, break, broke down into uh, different sources of funding, whereas uh, we expect that at least one third of these uh, will belong to private sources. The major focus is on the 70% of this budget is allocated to demonstration, pre-commercial and industrial rollout actions. So this is the main focus. Uh, with the main driver of uh, moving the sector to the uh, commercialization stage. Um, the document is structured in challenge areas and the areas uh, has been selected so that they have the highest impact up to this uh, date of 2025. So uh, industry, industry and research professional has agreed that uh, the most urgent and critical area is design and validation of ocean energy devices that you can see on the uh, right hand side of your screen and there are other challenge areas that support this overall aim uh, such as foundations uh, connections marine logistics and marine operations integration in the energy system and data collection analysis and modeling tools, but they are not supposed to, uh, to, to, to be um, achieved into isolation of this overall uh, or overarching goal. Um, then these challenges are also as a structure in priority topics, uh, which were selected on the basis of opportunity and urgency. And for each uh, for each um, priority topic, the strategic research and innovation agenda defines its scope, applicability, whether this is wave, tidal, or others, or, or both, uh, uh, section, uh, specific actions, expected impact, the entry and exit TRL, and the budget required in terms of the number of projects and the size, estimated size of projects in order to accomplish these goals. Um, we are today focusing on the design and validation of ocean energy devices, and more specifically on the demonstration of ocean energy devices to increase experience in, in real sea conditions. And within that part, uh, we focus on, on go, no go decisions, as Lotta said. These are uh, moments included in Horizon Europe calls for the demonstration projects. Uh, which are intended uh, to prepare open sea testing that really involves the commitment of significant resources, where there is a need to reduce the underlying risk. And therefore, these go no go analysis serves as a checklist that determines whether the project should enter the demonstration step or not. So the webinar explore questions such as what is required to pass this go no go gate, which evidence must be collected before entering the phase of open sea testing, or how has this ongoing project implemented to the go no go decisions into practice, as in the case study that we will hear uh, now in a moment. So this was my introduction. Thank you very much for your attention. And let's now uh, learn from other speakers about uh, the go no go moment. Thank you very much, Pablo. 
And just answering a question that we got here, this webinar is uh, recorded and it will be available on the ET Potion website uh, in a couple of days. So now I would like to give the floor to Robert Goodchild uh, to talk a bit more in detail uh, about the go, no go moment. Good. I'm just trying to share my screen. Yep, we can see it. And we can see it. Oh, we'll put it on this. Great. Okay, good. So good morning, everybody. And thank you for this invitation to speak on this. Um, I am the head of the unit within Cinea, which is responsible for the Horizon Europe Energy Programme. And I've been there for, for eight years now. And um, within Cinea, we're responsible for implementing uh, what the Commission has put in the work programmes for the different topics. And what it means now is we have um, around 500 active projects which are ongoing. And uh, we have managed, um, including those, around 800 projects covering Horizon 2020 and um, Horizon Europe now. And what I want to give you really is the benefit of our experience. So I have a team of people in the unit dealing with renewable energy, and some of them deal with ocean energy uh, within that. And so I've worked with them to put together our experience with the go, no go decisions. Um, so that I hope you can benefit from that. So just what I'm going to speak is about just a very brief introduction um, to explain the, the types of projects we manage. And then I will move on to the go, no go decisions and then a little bit about the expectations that we have. So the first thing I want to say is, is obviously you have the whole of the cluster five work program and with and this is uh, what Sunea implements and the bit that we're largely talking about here is in the destination three energy supply renewable energy, but there are many other projects, so we have experience in other in other areas too. And um, that has been very useful in trying to compare between sectors, how things work. And you'll have noticed that, uh, and I'll show this again in a minute, that go, no-go decisions are something that are particularly um, in the work program for the ocean energy sector. And um, that is, um, that's, that's for a particular reason. And I think um, I, I'd just like to spend a little, a little amount of time explaining some of the difficulties that we have had over the past few years in dealing with ocean energy projects, which I think explain will give you the context to why we think these go no go decisions are so important and why the Commission has decided to put these into the work program when it wouldn't necessarily have done so for other sectors. So, I mean, the first problem we have experienced with some um, is some proposals that we have turned into projects have been related to uh, what has been put in the proposal. And this we found is certainly in one big case, for example, that a, a, a cable, uh, a power takeoff cable, which was claimed to be in place in the proposal, wasn't actually in place in reality. And um, I mentioned that because I think it gives you an idea that this is a type of problem that we haven't had in other sectors. And uh, it's, it means that the, there is a certain level of trust issue here. Um, that I, I don't want to hide from you is that we, we need to be sure that we're getting accurate information. The second um, experience that we've had is that during the implementation of projects and often at, soon after the, we, we, the grant has been signed, uh, projects have come to us and said, well, actually, uh, we would like to do something different, a uh, different type of technology. Is that OK? And of course, our answer is generally, well, no, that's not OK. You've put in your proposal that you're going to do this. We've agreed with you to give you a certain amount of money to do that. Um, you need to do that. And what this has shown us is that in some areas of the, the ocean energy sector, um, there has been um, a sort of perspective that once they've got the money, they've got the grant, then there's a lot of flexibility to do what they want with it. And so we wanted to be sure that it was clear that um, the money is, is there for a particular reason and for what's been in the proposal. 
Um, similar issue that we've had it, with this is that during the projects, um, there has often been a um, very significant reduction in ambition. And uh, this is something that occurs sometimes in, in other sectors as well that we deal with. And of course, we're doing research here, uh, demonstration, things happen, the situations change, and we fully accept that. Um, but I think uh, what we've often seen is that elements of the project are then um, re removed. I said that they can no longer be done because there is no longer sufficient budget to do them. And of course, this is difficult for us to accept because it's not fair on the other proposals that have been put forward um, and considered by the experts during the evaluation. So we, we want to be sure that when um, a project is going to go ahead, that it's going to go ahead in its entirety, and it's not going to be stripped on the way of certain elements, which may be uh, not 100% core activities, but still nevertheless important for that, um, that, pro that project. Then I think an another thing we have uh, seen, obviously, is that uh, um, some demonstration projects take a, a long time to demonstrate and uh, the market conditions change. And this means that company projects, uh, companies priorities change as well. And of course, this is difficult if a company pulls out halfway through the project uh, and they're the core, te uh, the core technology provider, um, then we don't have a project anymore. It's very difficult. So we wanted to try and find a way um, to have some form of lock in to the projects um, that we can get them there. Uh, that once they, st they start, we can be sure very quickly whether they're going to continue or not. Um, because if the core technology provider isn't is no longer in the project, then the project shouldn't be existing anymore. Then um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, transparency. I think um, some of the challenges we've had with uh, with projects in, in the sector is that they haven't always been transparent in communicating what is going on in the project and problems that they've had. And um, it, it's difficult to have one simple explanation for this, but often we see that one of the elements seems to be because the financial construction of some of these projects is, is uh, quite fragile and they are concerned that if there's any bad news, uh, in the project that it will affect any ongoing um, negotiations with investors um, and so of course that, that makes it for us as the funding giver and as, as in a sense one of those investors as well uh, very difficult to have the overall the overall picture and then um, a, a final thing uh, obviously is projects often experience long delays now sometimes this can be for because uh, but for very good reasons. I mean, COVID had an impact on many, many, many of the projects that we manage, but it can also be because there are problems with suppliers, there are problems in arguments in the consortium, these types of things. And, and the problem is that um, there do seem to be more delays in, in the ocean sector. Uh, I appreciate that it's a, often a very hostile environment that you're having to demonstrate things in, so it's very difficult. It's a nascent sector in many ways. Um, compared to some of the more advanced sectors that we deal with. So it, it's it's fine that there are, um, we understand that there are challenges sometimes with the timetable. But what we what we find also is that there's a there's a delay in the in the part of the project that comes before the decision is to, to taken to actually build the demonstrator. And in that time, what happens is that um, the project continues to consume budget and it consumes budget because sometimes they have to have revised costings have to be asked for it sometimes consumes budget for communication the project coordinator etc cetera, etc cetera. and this is very it, it it's um it's obviously problematic because that budget then gets eaten up and it's not available for things later on in the project um and it also means that we, we're paying money for something when we don't actually have the certainty that it'll actually be demonstrated. And that really brings me on to the real reason why we want to have these go, no go decisions. It's that we want to be sure that the money that the EU is putting in is not just used as some sort of operating expenses um, for a project consortium to refine their ideas, to pay for them while they wait to have all the bids, 
um, to pay for them their activities um, until they get the final investment decision. We want to ensure that the money is there to pay for the actual demonstrator to be demonstrated, because that's why we've had these calls and that's what we're trying to achieve. So that's a rather long explanation for trying to explain to you, well, why on earth do we have these go, no, uh, go decisions? So in terms of, there have been a number of topics which have had them. Um, I, I'll list these on the screen. Obviously, you'll get this presentation afterwards. Um, and they started coming in around 2020, 2021. And at the moment, we have these 13 projects which are, which are there. And we will have um, the future topics coming up. Um, where we've identified these ones. And as you can see, the common, common theme is that they're all pretty much in, in mainly in one sector. Now, um, this is um, taken from the call, which will close on the 30th of March, and it has this bit in red. Don't worry about reading this here. I'm going to put it on the next screen. Um, so this is lots of text, which I apologise, but I think it, it shows you um, a bit what, what what's being looked for. Um, I admit that we are we are still learning with call texts and trying to clarify this. And so um, I'll come to a minute in a minute that if we may learn and need to clarify things through what we call frequently asked questions. So um, we want there to be a clear no go moment before entering deployment phase. OK. OK, and what do you have to do? I mean, you know this better than I do as project uh, developers. You need to have before that, you need your detailed engineering plans, you need your techno-economic assessments, um, you need to have um, all the permits there, um, you need to have certification if that's necessary. And uh, so that's before the go-no-go no, go moment in the project. So what does this mean um, it, in, it, in terms of what you have to have in the proposal is that the experts have to be able to see that you've got a clear and convincing pathway to get there. Okay, you don't have to have all the permits in place. Uh, you don't have to have the financial close, obviously, for these things. Um, but what you the experts have to be convinced that you will get there within the time that you state you will get there in the proposal. So if you say you'll be there in 15 months, we'd expect you to be there in 15 months. You know your industry best. You know what's likely to, to, to be possible. So we'd expect you to be the ones that determine that. And the experts will judge that. OK, so. Um, and that's it. So the experts in the evaluation will judge this. Now, during the project, um, as I said, we would expect you to produce the, the documents like engineering plans, a technical economic assessment, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but in reality, what we're also expecting you to do is to have um, uh, the finance, the, the financial, final investment decision um, to be taken. Um, that, in a sense, is your is when we think it's worth us um, checking that you are ready for the go no go moment. That's what we want to see. Before that, we don't really think that it's uh, it, it, the project is ready to be demonstrated. And once you're ready. We, uh, we will use independent experts and we will come and have a look at uh, so whether we think you are ready or not before giving you the, the OK. So what are we looking for um, is um, in the proposals, we expect you to propose uh, for a milestone and, of course, the verification that goes with it. Um, which is listing all the key deliverables which will contribute to that, um, which will we need to make the project move to the next phase. OK, so I've mentioned some of them. These are the types of things that would be credible. The experts will judge that credibility during the evaluation. And um, the FID, as I say, is likely to be a condition for this milestone. And then in practice, um, when the project is running, we will review the attainment of the milestone and uh, we'll link it to a, a payment, if, a, a periodic review period if, if necessary, and we will do that review with independent experts. So um, in practice, what does it mean? It means that the FID for the demonstrator needs to proceed the go no good decision. OK, the second thing, and this is we've seen a couple of cases recently, is that um, you shouldn't put in procurement, uh, uh, sign procurement or order materials or anything like that until you've taken the FID, um, because that's not sound, sound, sound financial management 
Uh, and clearly, if uh, the decision uh, from our perspective is a no-go, um, then you will not be reimbursed for any procurement activities you've done for the demonstrator um, because uh, it won't be demonstrated. We would expect during the project that if you have a delay in your uh, FID, that you would suspend the project um, until that's ready. And that means basically there are no coordination activities, nothing will be reimbursed by the by Cinea while the project is suspended. So you have to get yourselves ready at your own cost and then come back when the FID is ready. And of course, if it takes a lot longer than expected to get to your FID, we would expect you to terminate the project. We're not prepared to wait indefinitely for FIDs to, to come. Um, if they're not going to come within um, a reasonable period, and I'm not going to define a reasonable period, as you can understand, then um, I think you, um, you, you should be terminating your projects. So just come back quickly to the expectations. Uh, uh, we expect you to read the call text carefully, and this is partly because the, there are slight subtle wording differences sometimes between topics um, on this question of go, no, go. You need to check what we call the frequently asked questions. So when you go to the funding and tenders portal there, and you look at the particular topic uh, uh, of a particular call, then there's a link to frequently asked questions, and there we update them. Uh, if we've had questions uh, which, uh, to clarify exactly what is expected, we will we'll use the frequently asked questions. And it's important that you look at that before you su submit your proposal. We'd like, uh, we think the experts will want to see a credible, achievable milestone. Um, and of course, uh, that needs to be linked to the FID. And then we don't think you should be taking the go, no go decisions lightly. I mean, these are, this is the moment in the project uh, where we think it, it's about, uh, is it really going to happen? Is the demonstration really going, going to take place? Is all the money in place for it? These types of things. And the next thing is to keep Cinear informed, if you're lucky enough to have a project, of what's going on. We do not like surprises. It gives us the impression that you're not transparent with us and that you're taking the money that uh, the EU and taxpayers are offering you for granted. So any you need to keep Cinear well informed. And with that, I'd like to hand you back to, uh, to Lotta. Thank you so much, Robert. I think that was a very comprehensive overview and. Uh, Good to understand also the the reasons behind this go no no go decision uh, in these calls and and also remind ourselves to uh, you know proactively engage with Cinea in case there are delays um, uh, and really respect the the grant agreement and what was what was agreed with Cinea in terms of that project. So great, we have a few questions here, but uh, first let's go to um, our final speaker, Eunice Silva from Core Power Ocean. So the floor is yours, Eunice. So. Hi everyone, good morning. Let's see if I can successfully share my presentation. Make yes. sure that you're all able to see it. I hope the slides are now on the screen. Yes, perfect. Okay, fantastic, great. So. Hi everyone, good morning. My name is Yoni Silva. I'm a technical project manager at Core Power Ocean, and we are currently part of a project that is part of Cinea and the Horizon 2020 that it's called Use Course. And we've just gone through the go, no go moment in the project. And I it, it's great to be able to share with you what, what it's been like for us in this journey. So today I'm going to walk you through, give you a, an overview of the project. So what is EU scores about and what is our wave demonstration in Portugal? And then I'll show you a timeline of EU scores and what are the deliverables that contribute to our go, no go moment in the project. So to start up with EU scores, EU scores stands up for European Scalable Offshore Renewable Energy Sources. And it's a 45 million euro marine energy project that it's hoping to pave the way for bankable hybrid offshore parks. So if you have a combination of wave, wind and solar, what are the benefits that we can obtain from that? And we're trying to demonstrate that with a consortium of partners. And in the project, we have two demonstrators, one offshore solar PV demonstrator in Belgium, that it's a three megawatt offshore uh, solar PV farm in Belgium that it's 
uh, co-located with bottom fixed offshore wind. And in Portugal, we have a wave energy demonstration of 1.2 megawatts wave energy array by core power that is co-located with floating with a floating wind project nearby. So that's what we're looking into with EU scores. And the consortium of EU scores is consisting of 12 European countries and 17 partners. And the coordinator of the project is DMAC from the Netherlands. So you can see that we have several industry partners, universities, and developers that are coming together in, in this project. And we have several work packages that look into different uh, topics. So what we're trying to demonstrate is that if you have a hybrid farm where you can combine solar, wind, and wave, you can have a more consistent production profile, that it's a benefit for energy production and for the energy grid. And also what, what are the other gains that you can have if you co-locate? What are the economies of scale? What are the economies of shared infrastructure, shared maintenance activities? And the goal is to enable a rapid scale up in, until from now until 2025 to show, showcase that it's possible to, to scale up and have a large wave uh, and wind and solar parks combined together. So that's what EU scores is looking into. And now if I go into detail of what core power is doing inside the EU scores project. So Within the project, there are seven work packages. The work package four is the one that is related to the demonstrator in Portugal. And we have the 1.2 megawatt grid connected demonstration of wave energy converters. So we have four devices and the electrical connection hub in the north of Portugal in Agusadora. You can see there in the map. And then we have our core power base in Viana do Castelo. So that's where we actually assemble the wave energy converters and then tow them to the location in Agusadora that is has a substation that is run by EDP and other partners in Portugal that it's connected to the grid where the energy produced by the wave energy converters is going to be uh, connected to. So the demonstrator in Portugal has one fourth generation machine, which is our C4, which we are currently on the verge of deploying there. Then it will have a collection hub and our three of our C5 wave generator uh, machines. And as part of EU scores is the collection hub and two of our C5 machines. So we are actually already deploying C4. And as part of EU scores, we've been working on the design and the preparation of the deployment of the collection hub and two of the machines of our fifth generation. We have now progressed into a lot of activities. You can see there a picture of our C4 machine in the key in Vienna, ready, almost ready for deployment. We have deployed the anchors and the cables at the, near the substation. So you can see at the bottom left, the works we've done last year in May for the, the cable that it's connecting the substation to the offshore location, five kilometers away where the wave energy converters are going to be connected. And you can see there the boat work that we use to deploy the anchor and the actual cable lay during last year. So now looking into the EU scores timeline and how, how the project has been progressing and what was included for the go no go decision, which is the goal of our webinar today. So EU scores is a four year project that started in 2021. And the goal with the project was to have a go-no-go -no -go decision after one year of the project. So the, the, the goal was to gather all the deliverables and all the documents and milestones that would be required for the go-no-go -no -go decision, which are deliverables 4.1 to 4.3, which I'll explain to you further ahead what's included in those deliverables. And we had a milestone to be achieved, which was the design phase to be completed, to be ready for the go, no go decision. In reality, what happened is that by August, one year after the project had started, we had completed all the deliverables and milestones, and we were ready as a consortium to 
give ourselves a goal decision. So internally, we have reached that conclusion, but we waited a little bit longer to have the final um, decision with Sinea, just I think Sinea on an optimization of resources and attempting to, to try and have our meetings together as much useful as possible, join that go, no go final decision with the first reporting period, which just happened now in January. So it was the first reporting period of the project evaluation that was going on from September to October, from September, 2021, till October 2022, and all the financial and the technical reports were submitted for CINEA's evaluation, and that was done as a joint first reporting period conclusion, and also the official go-no-go -go on the project, which it was a very positive outcome. We got a go decision on the use course project, and the demonstrators both in Portugal and in Belgium are going ahead in the use course project. So now going into the details of what was included in the go, no go decision uh, procedure were the deliverables, the three deliverables that uh, I mentioned before. So the first deliverable was the, all the documents on co-financing and showing that core power had a solid financial uh, standing that could be financing the demonstrator and all the all the things that are required to actually be successful in putting the wave energy devices in the ocean. So we showed in 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 that uh, moment that we had had three successful investment rounds that there was proven investor interest in increasing their shares that we've had a healthy cash flow on the company back and going forward and that we had a new equity round upcoming so that we de-risked the financially the demonstration in Portugal. So we had to make sure and prove to Sinea that we were able financially to withstand the project and the demonstrator and all the challenges that we were facing during the first year of the project. So after the financial stand, there is deliverable 4.2 that was verifying that all the permits were in place. So for the demonstrator in Portugal, there's a, a, a multiple uh, licenses that are, are required. So if, if we needed to install a cable, we needed land permits, we needed permits to work on the beach, we needed permits from the municipality, from the authorities that uh, regulate energy and energy production. So it is a myriad of institutions and processes that need to be in place. So we had to make sure and prove to Sinea that we had obtained all the permits required for all the work to take place for the construction of the demonstrator and also for the future of energy production of the machines when they're going to be grid connected in Agosadora. So that was part two of the, of the GO documents and deliverables. And then part three was actually showing that our technology had been developed. So all our engineering plans, our operation and maintenance plans, all the environmental monitoring that is going to be taking place and the implementation plan. So by the time that we've submitted uh, all these documents, we had showed the concept of our technology in detail. We had shown the testing program that we had in Stockholm with the dry testing of the machine and already some of the results of the dry testing of the first uh, uh, full-scale uh, machine that we've developed in, in Sweden. All the maintenance and operations and monitoring plans that we had for, for the demonstrator. So all of this came together to provide the security that the demonstrator was going forward and that we actually already were working on uh, deploying the, the wave energy converters because the demonstrator in Portugal is also partially funded by other projects because EU scores is funding two machines and one hub, but there's already the first machine that it's going in. So I believe that also provides an additional security that the full demonstrator is going ahead. And that is all the 
examples I have for you today on our use course journey. I'll be happy to take any questions that you have ahead and I'll give it back to Lotta. Thank you. Thank you, Eunice. Uh, well, congratulations, first of all, um, on the success on the, on the project so far. So that really looks great. And I think the, those were very good, you know, tangible examples of what, what you did in, the, in your project. Now we have 15 minutes left, so uh, I will go through as many questions as I can. There are many, so we'll see how far we get. Um, so just looking at the list of questions here, I think this first one will be for Robert. So um, uh, the attendees asking for a clarification. So the FID is required in advance of the go no go decision. However, investment will be conditional conditional on a go decision from the EU, for example. So the project won't go ahead without EU funding. Uh, so is it acceptable that the FID is conditional on a go decision from the EU? This is a bit of a chicken and egg situation, I guess. Yeah, exactly. I think it's a chicken and egg situation. And it's a question. We, we, we would discuss that with the project in question and see the best way around this, because we don't want to cause additional delays to the uh, to the project or uh, delays full stop. So, yes, I think it's uh, that if you are lucky enough to get a project, then it would be discussed with your project advisor in Sinea how best to move forward. Thank you. Um, and another one on the what what the expected duration of the go no go completion is by also what's the expected duration of go no go completion by experts i guess how much time that they would um they would require for that assessment that's how i understand the question yeah again it, it, i'm assuming this question is about um the evaluation phase so what evaluation experts would uh, look at in the proposal and think that to be acceptable i think mm -hmm. it's really for each applicant to justify in the proposal uh, um, what what the time they need um, and that that's realistic i mean bear in mind that a typical innovation action so a demonstration project would usually be between four to five years or maybe four or five years so if if you're not going to be able to do it all within that sort of time window then the experts might might be more skeptical about your proposal but there are no fixed rules about how long an innovation action mm -hmm. can or cannot last but in general the average is that okay thank you um, then I have a question for Eunice here. Did the pushback from August 2022 to January 2023, as you showed on your slide, uh, lead to issues for the rest of the work package for program? No, so it, we carried on working and what we did, what we agreed with Sine at the time is as a consortium, we would have an internal go. So all the documents were evaluated between the partners and by the, the consortium lead. And we've decided to push ahead with an internal go and allow any procurement activities to start. And then the final confirmation go with Sinea would happen after the first reporting period. But we did a self-assessment via the consortium lead and we, we took that as a, a pre-official go. Okay, so you didn't have to suspend anything. It was just, yeah, great. All right, then the next question is about the business plan. Is the business plan required for the go, no go, just for the specific project or are the business plans, um, or is it the business plans of the developer and the partners required? I think this one goes to Robert. Yeah, I, I'll try with this one. I mean, I think we need to be a little bit, we have to look at the specific situation that's there. Mm. Um, but I mean, essentially, we're interested in the project. That's what we as the CNA are financing. Um, but obviously, you, if it's part of a wider a wider project, um, then it, that could have an influence too. And I think that's something we'd have to look at on a case-by-case -case basis. Okay, yeah. Um, and then a question in, on what constitutes the start of the deployment phase and how does it relate to the start of the fabrication phase? And there was another related question. Um, so when you say, I think this was Robert's in your presentation, ahead of entering the deployment phase, um, does 
the uh, European Commission consider this to be ahead of Sina, this to be ahead of fabrication and deployment, um, since deployment would often just be um, considered as installation of the device and subsequent operations. And Eunice, if, if you want, um, want to comment on this, don't hesitate to jump in as well. I'll try here, and I'm sorry if I'm clumsy with my uh, the words I use here, and, and they're not exactly the ones that you would use in a standard way in the industry. Um, what we are primarily concerned about is that all the money has to be there before uh, you're going to start um, purchasing all this equipment. We don't want to, you to start ordering stuff if you haven't got all the money there and not just the EU money. And so that's that's the point. You need to look at what, where the, main, the big cost items are and that we need to have everything ready um, before that, before the decision is taken to get move on with it. That's the thinking behind this. Now, it may be that different projects are set up slightly differently and we'd need to adapt, but um, that's the essential thing that I would ask my team to look at with uh, the projects in question. Okay, Eunice, did you want to chop in on that one? No, I think no, no. Okay, so, sorry, I, I saw you're nodding. So I thought you you wanted to jump in. Okay, um, then I think we answered the time for the go no decision or moment already. Um, and then, does Cine anticipate any controls following the go no go decision? There are many pressures on finance during the build and operation phases that may derail a project. So, I don't know if you already yeah. the kind I, of I, I mean of course so we have within most projects you have uh, three or four periodic reviews and at each of those that's the sort of standard time where we will do a more in-depth analysis of the progress with the project um, but that doesn't stop us doing in-depth analysis at any other point during the project and what we would expect is that there is a fluid communication between the project advisor and the coordinator of the project which would alert us immediately when there are issues that come up with financing, demonstrate um, it, to, um, actually putting the machine in the water, these types of things. So, so we know what's going on. So um, we, we will use external experts when we feel uh, that we need to within that. So we would expect there to be some form of control all the way through, but obviously, um, you know, you're, you're demonstrating something often in open water. We, mm -hmm. we, unless we have some Chinese spy satellites that we can use, which I'm afraid we don't at the moment, but uh, we, we're not going to be able to go and see it. So we are reliant uh, to a large extent on you um, to, to have that fluid communication. Rich, thank you. And the next one for you is, so how much discussion uh, did you have with Cinea once the deliverables were submitted for the go no go decision? So we have submitted the deliverables and then after that we we agreed that we would have the first review on the first reporting period that the documents would be reviewed both by Sinea and an external expert and we we kept communication because we had the date for the meeting that we knew we were all going to be in the same room and actually discussing things but we had the review from Sinea before and we we had questions beforehand so we could prepare for the potential questions and things that needed to be further understood and all of us could prepare everything that we needed to to answer the questions and have our experts from our technology development present in the meeting to make sure that we could all evaluate things properly and reach a consensus and make sure that everything was ready and good to move forward. Great, thank you. Um, I think I'll take a last question. I mean, to reiterate a question for Robert, I think this is just to, to really clarify. So a project, once a project has started and provided all of the material, material required by the um, by the go no go decision, how long can we expect that evaluation to take and for the EU to make their decision? And I saw, I think for Copper, it took six months. And Robert, you already mentioned that there's no set rule for that, but is there any expectation? Right. I mean, I, I fully understand that, uh, that once you've got everything there and ready, you want to you get on with the project. Um, so we will do our best to process it as, as quickly as possible if we need it, but it will depend to a certain extent on <clears throat> to what extent you've been submitting 
uh, deliverables regularly up until the certain moment. So, for example, if you've got um, you're at month 15 when you say everything ready and you've already got your permits in month six, if you've submitted that information, then we can have had a look with it beforehand. So there's a certain amount of preparatory work that we can be doing. Mm. But if we are going to be contracting an expert, um, to, uh, an external monitor to help us with this, then we're only going to contract that person when we have the documents from you. So that, and that will take time to, and, and on availability. So I would estimate that um, you know, we would aim for two to three months um, to, to have a decision within that time. But I want to stress that it really depends on the level of cooperation and timely delivery of everything else before that um, mm. as, to, as to how long it would take. Thank you. So it's really important to keep your um, project um, uh, officer at CINEA informed and and have that have that those discussions ongoing even before submitting all the all the documents. Okay, I think I took most of the questions here. We um, need to wrap up now. Um, just checking. I think we we touched upon all of the. All of the themes now. So, just a reminder, everyone, that this uh, recording will be will be shared on the ETIP Ocean website. We have um, an events and webinars a web uh, page there, so you can find it there easily. And uh, the presentations will be will be uploaded there as well. So, with that, I would like to thank all our speakers. Thanks, Eunice, Robert, and Pablo for joining this webinar. I think this was very useful and hopefully. Uh, helpful for for the the next proposals that many uh, many developers and many players are now preparing for the for the next demonstration call uh, due in a couple of months and then for the next one after that um, for wave as well. So thank you everyone and uh, we'll see you in the next webinar. Bye. Bye everyone. Bye.